Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Kirsten Hunter. I'm the Director of Lifespan Ministries here at South Church, and it is my deep honor to be offering the message this morning. And as always, our worship services at South Church are a group effort of contributions and heart from so many different people. I am joined this morning with our worship associate, Arthur Eves, and our music director, Joanne Connolly. And I'm gonna pass it along to Arthur to share with you a few other folks who are engaged with our worship service today. Good morning. My name's Arthur Eves, and I'm one of a team of worship associates who are blessed to assist our fabulous staff here at South Church. Spotlighting another UU congregation this week, our story will, is shared with us from Foothills Unitarian Church in Fort Collins, Colorado. And a special thanks, as always, goes out this week to Kirsten, Jennifer Layden, Christine Sawyer, Jen Daldeo, Joanne Connolly, Reverend Susan, Tip Clues, and many others besides behind the scenes who have worked hard to prepare this service. And now, Joanne will tell you about today's music. Thank you, Arthur. Good morning, everyone. So glad to offer music this morning. Susan Adams and I will be offering music around healing and moving forward after the election. So I'm glad you're here to participate with us this morning. Enjoy the service. Thank you. It's time again for the South Church Giving Garland. While this year's garland will look a little bit different, we are still collecting gift cards to give to local organizations to help our community in need. Gift cards for things like gas, groceries, clothes, and entertainment are collected, divided up, and dispersed to places like Crossroads House, Women Aid of Greater Portsmouth, and Families First. You can drop off gift cards to the office at 73 Court Street, put them in the Court Street mailbox if you happen to be walking by, or mail them directly to the office. Once gift cards are all collected, we will let the congregation know what we received and where all the gift cards went. If you have any questions, please reach out to Jen Lydon at jen at southchurch-uu.org. And don't forget to check your Sunday morning email for lots of other exciting announcements. Our annual Christmas Eve services will be held at 5 and 9 p.m. this year on the Zoom platform. That's a little different than our regular virtual services, which we are streaming on YouTube. For Christmas Eve, in order to have a little more connection with one another and to recreate our candle lighting tradition, we're going to be meeting on the Zoom platform Keep your ears out for opportunities to practice using Zoom if you aren't yet feeling comfortable doing so, and mark your calendars for Christmas Eve at 5 or 9 p.m. to join us for this special annual tradition. I was passing by, my sister called to me, and she said to me, you better take time in life, take time in life, take time in life, take time in life, cause you got far way to go. I was passing by, my brother called to me, and he called to me, saying, take time time in life take time in life take time in life take time in life cause you got far way to go i was passing by my teacher called to me and she said to me you better take time in life take time in life take time in life take time in life cause you got far away to go to that 
that land Come and go with me to that land Come and go with me to that land Where I'm bound, where I'm bound Come and go with me to that land 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 Where I'm bound There'll be freedom in that land Justice in that land, there'll be justice in that land, there'll be justice in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There'll be justice in that land, there'll be justice in that land, there'll be justice in that land where I'm bound. They'll be singing in that land. Our chalice will be lit this morning by Ruby. The words are by Rumi. You are the drop and the ocean. You are kindness. You are anger. You are sweetness. You are poison. And now let us affirm our mission statement, reciting together. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people, and we inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. Her story this morning is the story titled Old Turtle and the Broken Truth. Is written by Douglas Wood and performed by young people at Foothills Unitarian Church in Fort Collins, Colorado, and used with generous permission from that congregation. Enjoy. A land where every stone was a teacher, and every breeze was a language where every lake was a mirror and every tree a ladder to the stars. Into this far and lovely land there fell a truth. It streaked down from the stars, but as it fell, it broke. One of the pieces blazed off through the night sky, and the other fell to earth in the beautiful land. In the morning, Crow found the fallen piece. It seemed to be sort of a stone, shiny and pleasing to the eye. She picked it up. This is a lovely truth, said the Crow. But after she had held it for a while and examined it closely, Crow noticed that it did not feel quite right, so she dropped it on the ground and flew away. Then, a human being found it, and when he found the broken truth, he picked it up. On it was writing, and the writing said, you are loved. The man held it carefully, thinking it was the loveliest thing he had ever seen. He tucked the broken truth into his pocket and kept it. Sometimes he would take it out and admire it. He thought that it sparkled just for him and whispered its message to him.
him alone. The man took the wonderful truth to his people, and together they cherished their newfound truth, and they believed in it. They hugged it to themselves, and it became their most precious possession, and they called it the truth. The truth made the people feel good and proud and strong, but soon they also began to feel fear and anger towards those who were not like themselves and did not share their truth. Many battles were fought, and the broken truth was won and lost and won and lost over and over again. The stones and the trees suffered and the animals, and the earth, and most of all, the people suffered. Until, one day, a little girl who was troubled by the suffering decided to go looking for help. After traveling many days, she came to a great hill in the very center of the world, and there she found Old Turtle. Why have you come so far to find me, little one? asked Old Turtle. To ask, ask a question, answered the little girl. Where I live, the earth is sore, people suffer, battles are fought, people say it has always been this way and will never change. Can it change? Can we make it change? Old Turtle told her how the people had fought down the broken truth and the suffering that it had caused. You must remember, the broken truth and life itself will be mended only when one person meets another, someone from a different place, or with a different face, and sees themselves. Now you must return to your people and tell them what you've seen and learned. But wait, take this with you. Old Turtle placed something in the girl's hand. I've saved this for a very long time, for someone just like you. It was a kind of a stone, a mysterious, beautiful stone. It was lovely to touch, and it made her feel good inside. Thank you, Old Turtle, she said, and she returned home. But when she arrived, the people did not recognize her, and when she spoke, they did not understand her. Finally, she saw their great truth where it was kept, in a high tower above the village, and she knew what to do. She climbed to the high place. She took Old Turtle's stone from her pocket, and carefully she added the missing piece to the old broken one. The fit was perfect, and now the writing on the stone said, You are loved, and so are they. The people looked, and looked, and looked. Some frowned, some smiled, some even laughed, and some cried, and they began to understand. Time passed on the beautiful land. The trees climbed like ladders to the stars. The waters shone like mirrors. And the people saw their beauty. A breeze stirred and they heard its music. And tiny truths fell by day and night gentle as rain and snow, and the people found them and kept them in their hearts. And slowly, as the people met other people different from themselves, they began to see themselves. And far away on a hill, in the very center of the world, old turtles smiled.
Um, but I think what I, I grew to appreciate, like actually especially after I graduated college, which is ironic because I stopped, I mean graduated high school, especially after I graduated high school, which is odd because like that's when I started going less and less, but I was just, it always felt good to have a community to come back to, which was really nice. Um, and, and like people that I grew up with and being able to see the same people like, still doing good work, still being nice, still caring about what was going on with me. Um, and especially like when the world gets dark or when I'm going through something, it's, it's nice to have a space where you can kind of get a spiritual recharge and just a, okay, there's still good people in the world doing good work and like we, we can make it through this and we're a community and it always feels nice to come back to that and have that. And why are you glad that we're still a, connected to South Church? Hmm. Gives, uh, being connected to South Church gives my dad something to do. <laughs> but um, I just, I love coming back and seeing friends and like just friendly faces and people who have, I've grown up with and who like, I want to I wanna know how they're doing and they want to know how I'm doing. And um, we're still working for the betterment of our community and like, still fighting the good fight um, and I just I like having that community and knowing that it's there to support me um, whenever I whenever I need it which is really nice what do you think you took away from South Church like into the world I think that South Church helped enforce in me the sense of wherever you go you should be doing service you should serve um, your community in some way or another and I think I really love that about our community is everyone kind of walks their talk like it's not just we're going to go and talk about being nice now we're actually going to try and make the world a better place and we're going to fight racism and we're going to fight climate change and we're going to like do real important work and i i really like that i think that's super important um that i grew up and i realized wow i'm actually not surrounded by hypocritical adults these people are actually like embodying the values that i was raised with um and i really appreciate that and i took that with me for sure Now is the time where we have the opportunity to share our offerings with other organizations in the larger community. In this month of Thanksgiving and Healing, we are supporting Seacoast Family Promise, a community-based organization that provides housing and the means for a sustainable future to families with children facing challenges. This winter, those challenges are likely to be significant in our communities. They can use our assistance. You can donate by following the instructions on your screen, which will be shown again after the service. You can also donate by going directly to our website, southchurch-uu.org, clicking on the Giving tab and then the link to Shared Collections.
Please join me this morning in a time of prayer, followed by meditation. If you have a prayer you would like to share, we invite you to take this time to write that into our live chat box. Know that you are held, know that we are here, even in these strange times with virtual worship. We are here, we are holding you in love. prayer I'd like to offer this morning is an adaptation of a prayer written by Reverend Ted Loder called Keep Me in Touch with My Dreams. In the turbulence and the loneliness of my living from day to day and night to night, keep me in touch with my roots so I will remember where I came from and with whom. Keep me in touch with my feelings so I will be more aware of who I really am and what it costs. Keep me in touch with my mind so I will know who I am not and what that means. And keep me in touch with my dreams so I will grow toward where I want to go and for whom. Deliver me from the arrogance of assuming I know enough to judge others. Deliver me from the timidity of presuming I don't know enough to help others. Deliver me from the illusion of claiming I have changed enough when I have only risked a little that so liberated I will make some of the days to come different. I ask not to be delivered from the tensions that wind me tight, but I do ask for a sense of direction in which to move once wound. A sense of humor about my disappointments, a sense of respect for the elegant puzzlement of being human and a sense of gladness for your kingdom, which comes in spite of my fretful pulling and tugging. Oh, nurture in me, the song of a lover, the vision of a poet, the questions of a child, the boldness of a prophet, the courage of a disciple. May it be so. I've been thinking a lot lately about the dominant culture in which we live here in the US. I feel like we don't talk about culture enough. 
This isn't meant as a criticism. Culture is inherently elusive. It is, as they say, the water we swim in. The thing is, culture is not universal. Neither is water, really. While all fish swim in water, you can bet a fish would have something to say if it could say something about the water if they were suddenly moved from the ocean to a mountain lake. That is not the same water. And just as that fish would want to address the fact that there was not enough salt to meet their needs in that lake, we too need to talk more about what is healthy and what is harmful in the culture we inhabit together. There is a lot to say about culture, but today I would like to talk about how our culture relates to our ability to heal. To begin, I'm going to ask you to accept as true the following statement about the dominant culture around us. I'm not making it up. There is some solid research I can point you toward if you would like to read more. We live in a culture that normalizes individualism and either or thinking among other things. Normalizing is something we do as human beings. It can be helpful. We have normalized brushing our teeth twice a day, for example, which has obvious benefits. The problem with normalizing particular things is that when something is normalized, it makes it very difficult to challenge if it has destructive consequences. Look at the floating island of plastic in the Pacific Ocean and ask yourself why we still sell millions of cases of bottled water every month. Now, before I go further along in discuss discussion about individualism and either or thinking and how it relates to healing, I first do want to acknowledge that we are each individuals. In her memoir, The Country Under My Skin, author Gioconda Belli wrote about a moment in her childhood when she suddenly realized that she would be alone in her body forever. I can still feel that surge of adrenaline, she wrote, the sudden awareness that accompanied this irrefutable fact. In a single terrifying instant, I became acutely aware that nobody could share my inner space feel what I felt, listen to my innermost thoughts. I could never experience what it would be like to be someone other than the little girl I was in my uniform of pleat pleated skirt and white blouse. It dawned on me that I could never look at myself directly in the face. I could only do it through a mirror. For a few days, I was quite disconcerted by the enormity of my realization. I was baffled by the random design that had made me born where I was born, arbitrarily deciding I would come into the world with a silver spoon in my mouth, instead of as one of those broken, scraggly little waifs who ran after our car, banging on the windows, begging for change, and in whose eyes I saw with painful clarity, the very same bewilderment I felt. We may not all have the same experience of a sudden awakening to the singularity of self, but it is true, we can only ever be ourselves and that we will never truly know what it means to be anyone else. It doesn't mean we can't try. We're, all, we're each living in an indisputably individual life. My road is just mine, but here you are walking along it with me. We share the same thirst, the same starts and stops, the same betrayal and joy and devastation and seeking, and also we don't. In her po poem titled Revolutionary Letter Number Two, Diana de Prima writes, the value of an individual life, a credo they taught us to instill fear and inaction. You only live once, a fog in our eyes. We are endless as the sea, not separate. We die a million times a day. We are born a million times. Each breath, 
Life and death. Get up. Put on your shoes. Get started. Someone will finish. Tribe. An organism. One flesh breathing joy as the stars breathe destiny down on us. Get going. Join hands. See to business. Thousands of sons will see to it when you fall. You will grow a thousand times in the bellies of your sisters. So we are all ultimately alone and we are all one interconnected organism. But it is possible for both things to be true. Month of November is often when I find myself thinking about how well I did with my garden this year. The first hard frost has happened. I've been working my way through the autumn rituals that come with putting that small plot of dirt to bed. The wilted tomato vines, dahlia and squash leaves always seem to finish the season with some powdery mildew, which I don't want to invite into my compost pile. So they go out to the curb in brown paper bags. I turn the wild late season arugula into its bed to seed for next year. Clipping back the raspberries who are set on overtaking the blueberry bush who is doing its own work of dropping its leaves as if to wave defeat or play dead for the raspberries and trick them into slowing their march. My garden is very small and I love seeing plants flourish and thrive, but when you have limited space, you have to listen as the garden teaches you how much and what to plant. Every spring, my eyes are bigger than my garden. I think to myself, I know there's only enough room for two zucchini plants in this spot, but I look at the seeds and I think we can fit three. It is in August and September that my short-sightedness grows into view. Maybe it's stubbornness. This is the season, this time of year, when every year I recommit to listening to the plants. I will pull the raspberry vines back further this year. And when they start creeping over toward the blueberry this year, I will tell them no. This year, I will put my foot down. A seasoned gardener knows that leaving space is as important as sun and food and water. The wisdom comes over time, like rings in a tree spanning out one after the next with autumn lessons informing the choices of the following spring. The wisdom comes from the teachers that surround the gardener, the plants and insects, the molds and unripe fruits. I am healing. Slowly my garden is teaching me to stop thinking my brain can rewrite the truth. My garden is telling me to pay attention to our shared body, an organism, one flesh, breathing joy as the stars breathe destiny down on us. I'm learning to see it year by year, healing from the individual life healing from the destructive belief that I am separate from any other living thing, and therefore that I might find the answer without listening to those around me. Healing which does not mean I am not, no longer alone in my body. It means I no longer live by that credo, you only live once. That I am alone in my body in a sense, but I am also alive in yours, and you are alive in me. There is movement in the kind of healing I'm trying to describe, a breaking of the dam that separates me from you, that prevents a flow from the self to the world beyond. It's an orbit. There is instinct to it and grace. It is not all about me and I am a part of it. We witness this movement in water cycles and plant cycles. We see it in evolution and under microscopes in laboratories. We name it in poetry and strive to embody it as seekers. We also see evidence 
of when it is blocked. In the novel Transcendent Kingdom by Yag Yasi, the main character is at a party listening to the guests. Whenever I listened to them speak about issues like prison reform, climate change, the opioid epidemic, in the simultaneously intelligent but utterly vacuous way of people who think it's important simply to weigh in, to have an opinion, I would bristle. I would think, what is the point of all this talk? What problems do we solve by identifying problems, circling them? When I read her words, I found myself nodding. I mean, the work of identifying problems is important work, but only as a step on the way toward addressing them. When it is treated as an intellectual exercise, the most nuanced understanding of a problem becomes worse than meaningless. The equivalent of knowing that the blueberry bush is struggling because its resources are being stolen by the raspberries, but not even considering that you have the ability to strategically change your raspberry policy. Identifying problems as an intellectual exercise is a symptom of someone who does not see themselves as part of the interconnected whole, who has not discovered how to get going, join hands, see to business. We are each a part of each other. I know that to be true. Perhaps in this moment, we are becoming more aware of that truth. The air I breathe in includes air you have exhaled. The water in my body will find its way back to the ocean. Maybe these strange days where we don't get to be together with one another as much, where we are grasping for ways to connect, maybe they are helping us to see just how connected we are to one another. Maybe that realization is scaring people because when we acknowledge that we are all connected, then we must recognize that what has happened to any of us has happened to all of us. So what does it mean to heal from an individual life? Healing from an individual life means realizing that the wounds that any of us experience inevitably affect the wider world. And so we invest our time and resources to tend to our traumas. We leave space to treat our wounds. It is not indulgent, it is necessary. We do no one any favors by admiring the ability to keep your problems to yourself. If we do not prioritize our own healing, it affects everyone and collectively, we are able to help each other heal. That is true for a church community and a city and a country and a planet. Healing from an individual life means we begin to relish the opportunity to consider other experiences beyond our own because we realize that each of those experiences enrich our collective perspective. They help us move the ball down the field. The more we discover the complexity that comes from diverse wisdom, the more we realize how incomplete the libraries of our minds have been, the more we discover false assumptions and incomplete solutions. Healing from an individual life means we begin to celebrate what we can learn from our mistakes, perhaps even more so than what we learn from our successes. A culture of perfectionism and defensiveness is replaced by a recognition that mistakes will happen and a curiosity about how those mistakes might offer opportunities for growth and learning. Healing from an individual life means before we start strategizing about how to solve a problem, we first ask who is most directly impacted by this problem and have they participated in articulating the problem itself and coming up with a possible solution? Do they have a seat at the table? And then we ask, 
who else might have already started working on this challenge? We know inherently that our individual knowledge is limited, but our collective knowledge is expansive. We know that our individual time is limited, but our collective time is expansive. And what we can accomplish when we work together and build on each other's efforts is incredible. That if we can let go of taking credit, we all get to take the credit together. Get up, put on your shoes, get started. Someone will finish. There is not a particular place to begin. The trick is to keep the movement going like an infinity loop. On one side, there is you learning and unlearning, healing hurts, discernment, rest, food, sleep. There is your spiritual practice, exercise, love, your closest people amidst that internal work. Even there, you are not alone and moving from you to us, which is just as important. Tending to our collective garden, always thinking about how to expand the definition of us. If I told you there is no such thing as charity, how would that affect how you think about service? Our call to this world is not for someone else. It is for tomorrow, maybe. It is for what might be possible, not in some Pollyanna way, not with the expectation of some idealist's fantasy. It is the imperfect gardening, deciding how much and what to plant, considering the spacing, thinking about how much light and water and food we will need. It is the act of doing it together healing and growing, healing and growing. May it be so. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we're together again. It's our benediction this morning. I will read again the poem Revolutionary Letter Number Two by Diana de Prima. The value of an individual life, a credo they taught us to instill fear and inaction. You only live once, a fog in our eyes. We are endless as the sea, not separate. We die a million times a day. We are born a million times. Each breath, life and death. 
get up, put on your shoes, get started. Someone will finish. Tribe, an organism, one flesh, breathing joy as the stars breathe destiny down on us. Get going, join hands, see to business. Thousands of sons will see to it when you fall. You will grow a thousand times in the bellies of your sisters. Amen and blessed be. Here are some ways that you can give to South Church. To make your 2021 pledge, fill out and mail your financial commitment form to South Church at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth, or send an email to the Annual Budget Committee Chair, Lori Bilby, at turningtide at comcast.net. To pay your pledge or to make donations, go to the South Church website southchurch-uu.org, click on the donate button on the top and follow the prompts. You can also mail us a check to South Church at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth, noting the type of gift that you are making. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out at 603-436-4762 or by emailing info at southchurch dash uu dot org.